Welcome back to Study Buddy. Today on Python programming, we'll be covering some basic concepts regarding computer programming, such as the vocabulary programmers use, data types, which are how computers categorize information, and basic arithmetic, so things like addition and subtraction that the computer can do. So make sure to check the description for some helpful timestamps that'll help guide you through this video. And let's start off by opening up our idle. Let's go up to File and click on New File. And we have our new program here. And this is where I'm going to begin talking about a few vocabulary and a few little things that programmers do that I think everyone should know in order to understand other lessons about computer science and these lessons about programming from here on out. The first of which is commenting. Commenting is basically how you clarify your code, how you write notes in your code. But that's enough of a definition. Let's try and show you what a comment looks like. So for instance, let's have our print hello world function right here. And how about instead of hello world, we put in like the number 13. And let's say for instance that this number 13, we have this very long program and this number 13 is like essential for this program to work, right? And as the person who created the program, like obviously we'd say this 13 is very important. But other people that are reading this program may look at this 13 and might not see the importance. They may think like, oh, it's just a 13, right? So they'll just brush on by it when, as the person who programmed this program, you may think like, wow, this is very important. And this is where commenting can come in really handy. So how commenting works in almost every single programming language is you put in some form of a character. It's different for each language, but for Python, it's a hashtag. And then you put a space. And then anything after, or anything to the right of that space, will not be read as code when you run the program. In fact, it won't even be read at all. So I can put this jumble of letters here, and it'll skip it. I can, well, most people would put here, like, clarification about the code, so I can do clarification about the number 13. And um, just to demonstrate that the computer completely skips the rest of the line after it reads, like, one of these comment characters, how about let's put in print hello world behind the hashtag. So basically, if this comment does work, then it should not print hello world. And if this comment doesn't work, then it should print hello world. But regardless, it should always print the number 13. So let's go up to file, click on save, and I will save this as lesson one in my home folder. And let's click on run on the top and then run module. And as you can see here, it gave out the number 13, and it gave us our prompt here, which defines the end of a program running, which demonstrates that it prints 13, and it does not print hello world, because hello world is after a comment character. And anything to the right, or anything after a comment character, is just not read at all whenever you run a program in computer programming. So, in summary, commenting is how you just write notes to yourself, clarify your code, and in some cases, like, playtest your code. Like, for instance, if I have, like, how about let's have a print 14 down here, and I'm wondering, like, which one's breaking my program, I can just put, like, a hashtag right here, and then I can see if the issue still persists. So, commenting is also useful in that sense. But that's enough about commenting. Let's talk about like two pieces of vocabulary that you will never stop hearing when you're learning computer programming. So the first of which is a function. Functions are basically commands that the computer follows. And they have an input and an output. So for instance, an example of a function can be the print function. And what a function looks like is it's a word and then a pair of parentheses. Another example of a function can be the help function, which is the word help, and then a pair of parentheses. And in functions, there's almost always something inside of these pair of parentheses. And in this case, anything inside of this parentheses is considered the input. So for instance, if we do print hello world, in quotation marks, inside of this print function, then basically, inside this print function, our input is hello world. So if we save this program here and run it, our output will be the computer prints out hello world in the terminal, or the interactive shell. So basically, functions are commands that have an input and an output, and it's really as simple as that. So now, let's move on to another piece of vocabulary, which is methods. And methods are really similar to functions, because they're also commands that the computer follows. 
and they also have an input and an output. Now one thing you need to note here is that methods only affect a portion of a program. So for instance, an example of a method can be the upper method, which is a period, the word upper in a pair of parentheses. Another example of a method can be the alpha method, which is the period, the word alpha, and then a pair of parentheses. So basically you could say that a method is a function behind a period. But the difference about methods is that normally the input is not in parentheses. The input is actually in front of the period. And this also demonstrates like what portion of the program we're affecting. So basically, for instance, if I put the word Bob in front of this upper method right here, then what this essentially is saying is it's taking Bob as an input for the command upper. So basically, this upper command will apply itself onto Bob and only Bob. So to basically summarize everything I just said, functions are commands that the computer follows which have input and output and they consist of a word and a pair of parentheses. And it takes whatever is inside those parentheses as input. Methods are also commands that the computer follows, and they also have an input and an output. However, the difference is that methods only affect a portion of the program. So your input occurs before the period in your method, and that'll be the portion of the program that this method or this command will apply to. And a method always consists of a period, a word, and a pair of parentheses, except there almost always is nothing inside of these parentheses. And that is all the basic fundamentals you're going to need to know for computer programming. Now let's move on to data types. So as I've referenced before, computers have a lot of input and output. You know, there's a lot of functions, there's a lot of methods, so the computer's gonna be processing lots of different types of input. And obviously, the computer cannot process different forms of input in the same way. Like, for instance, if I have a function that adds four to whatever the input is, if I input one, of course, it would output five. But if I input a photo, that's not going to work. So basically, because of this, Computers categorize all inputs that it can ever get into a few dozen data types. So basically, you can say that a data type is a category of information. And as I said before, there are dozens of these data types. However, we're only going to focus on four of them, which are in almost every single programming language. The first of which are strings, and then second we have integers, third we have floats, and fourth, we have Booleans. These four data types are in almost every single programming language that is out there. So let's talk about strings. Strings mainly cover text, and they are defined with quotation marks. And generally, these are words. So an example of a string can be dog, or another example can be hello world. Another example of a string can be a whole bunch of random characters. And this is still a string because all of these characters are inside quotation marks. Another example of a string can just be the numeric digit for three. And you may think like, oh, that's a number. But like, because this number is inside quotation marks, it's defined as a string. And do note that I am using different quotation marks for all of these strings. And in Python, this is completely fine. It doesn't matter if you define a string using double quotation marks or single quotation marks, there's no issue. But do note that in other programming languages that they almost always only use double quotation marks. So you could build the habit of using only double quotation marks to define your strings and all that. But I'm just going to use single quotation marks because it's a lot more convenient. So now we have four strings, and how about let's try saving this program, right? And running it. What would happen if we run it, right? Like, would it just like print out these four strings? Like, what's going on, right? So let's run this module. And as you can see, we have our prompt here, which means that we're at the end of the program. And as you can see, nothing happened when we run the program. And the reason for that is going to be something that you're going to have to become very familiar with in computer science, which is that computers are very blunt in the way that they think, and basically they won't do something unless you tell them to do it, or tell them how to do it. 
So basically, you may have thought like, oh, it'll just print out these four strings, but obviously, if you don't tell the computer to print out these strings, then it just won't, right? Why waste all that computing power just to do something that the user didn't ask for? So how about let's put all of these strings inside of print functions. All right, so now let's go up to File, click on Save, go up to Run and click on Run Module. And as you can see here, now it prints up these four strings. So that's great. But obviously not everything is going to be text when you input it, right? There's got to be some more data types out there. And this is where I'll introduce to you integers. Integers are really simple. They're just whole numbers. So basically, an example of an integer can be this humongous number. It can be the number 0, or it can be the number 3. And do note how all of these integers are not surrounded by quotation marks, because if they're surrounded by quotation marks, those would not be integers, but strings. A common misconception that people have about integers is they may think like, oh, I'll put in like a Roman numeral. And that will not work because of a reason we'll explain in the next episode. And if you put like the number one, like typed out into a word, that will also not work either because integers, I should note this right here, are whole numbers consisting of only numeric digits. So basically, these three would be integers, but the Roman numeral for four wouldn't be an integer, writing out the number four would not be an integer, only whole numbers that consist of only numeric digits. So how about let's put these in print functions real quick. All right, so let's go to File, click on Save, go to Run, click on Run Module. And as you can see here, it prints out our three integers right here. But obviously, if you've ever been in a higher up math class, you'll understand that not all numbers are whole numbers. There are fractions, there are decimals, and this is where floats come in. Floats stand for floating points numbers. I had no clue what this meant either when I first wrote that out, but it's basically decimals. An example of a float can be 1.9, or like this humongous decimal right here. Another example can be 0 0.9, or 3.0, even 3 point. These are all floats because they all consist of numeric digits and they have a period in it, or a decimal point in this case. So I don't really feel like uh, printing out all of these floats, so I'm only going to print out this last one here. So let's put that in the print function, let's save it and run it. And as you can see, our float prints down here. But hold on, you may have just noticed something right here. Let me try and clarify it right now. As you can see, this output, we have three different threes. And they look almost identical to each other, but they're all three different data types. So how the heck am I supposed to know which number three is what data type if they all look the same? And this is where a very helpful function comes in called the type function. The type function outputs the data type of the input. So that may be like a little hard to wrap your head around. But basically, the way you use the type function is you tell the computer to print the type, because you can't just have the computer compute the type and do nothing about it. Of, For instance, for this type function, how about let's put the number three in quotation marks as the input. And let's just copy and paste this two more times. In our second one, we'll just have the number three without quotation marks. In our third one, we'll just have three point. And how about let's just save this and run it. And as you can see, we have our class string. Don't worry about the class now. Basically, our first type is a string, our second type is an integer, and our third one is a float. And obviously you just look at these and you're just like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But later on, when you're building more complex programs, you may be really confused about like what data type some like humongous thing is. So this type function is very helpful in identifying what data type something is. And you can use it later to check if something is a certain data type in order to make things compute better. So a type function is very useful in that way. But enough about that. Let's move on to Booleans. Booleans are very simple. They are literally just true or false. And do note that the T 
and the F are capital in this programming language. So you may think like, why is this important, right? But booleans are very important because they can be stretched to mean a lot of different things, right? On or off, day or night, alive or dead, you know? These are all things that, in summary, are either true or not true, or true or false. So basically, for instance, you can print out true with a capital T. And do note that these are also not in quotation marks, because if they were in quotation marks, these are not booleans, but strings. So how about let's also print out the type of false with a capital F. So let's go up to File, click on Save, go up to Run, click on Run Module. And as you can see here, we have our true, and it's in the class of Boolean. So in summary, data types are just categories of information because computers have a lot of different inputs, so they need to categorize it in some way. And there's a lot of them, but the main ones consist of strings, which are mainly text and defined by quotation marks. Next we have integers, which are whole numbers, and they only consist of numeric digits. Our third one are floats. Uh, these stand for floating point numbers, which is basically a decimal. So floats are basically decimals. Then we have our type function, which gives us the data type of whatever is inputted into the type function. And lastly, we have booleans, which are literally just true or false. And that is all we're going to cover for data types. You may think like, oh, this is kind of like really useless, but it'll make a lot more things make sense if you understand this right now. So it's good to know. And finally, let's move on to arithmetic. Arithmetic is basically basic math, so things like PEMDAS and such. And you know, I could, for instance, just tell you like, oh, print two plus two, but like that's, that's just gonna be a lot of print functions and a lot of unnecessary work for no reason. So because of this, I'm going to demonstrate one feature of Python that you are going to really love and something that is almost always unique to Python and that is the interactive shell. So let me clear this out by closing this interactive shell, saving my program and running it. And as you can see, we have a completely blank shell. So basically, one of the greatest things about Python, in my opinion, is this interactive shell. And the great thing about it is, regardless of whatever is inputted, there is always going to be some form of an output in this interactive shell. So for instance, the interactive shell can run single lines of code. You can put in a print function like how about let's do print hello world and as you can see our output is hello world. You could even just do hello world in a string and it'll output hello world. A great example of this can be the type function. Let's say you, you just need to quickly find the type of the number three in quotation marks. It'll just output the type without the need for like a print function or anything and this is very helpful because the interactive shell can help you check things in your programs, and in this case, cut off a lot of time writing out print functions. So let's talk about basic arithmetic now. So let me just restart this interactive shell again to just clear things out. And let's cover some basic math operators in PEMDAS. So first we have addition. Addition uses the plus sign as per usual. And as you can see, two plus two outputs four. The subtraction sign, uses the subtraction symbol, or in this case, just a dash. So four minus two outputs two. The multiplication sign you may be familiar with, like is like very difficult to write that multiplication sign. So programmers thought it would be a lot more helpful to use a star instead of a multiplication sign. So five times four, as you can see, is 20. And division, as you know, division also has a very complicated sign that is very difficult to type, so we just put a forward slash to somewhat represent a fraction here. So six divided by two is three. And one thing you do need to note regarding division is that it always outputs a float, regardless of whether both inputs are integers or not. So this is kind of like a catch-all so your program doesn't break over some simple division. So those are four basic math operators. But a great thing about Python and other programming languages is there are a lot more math operators that can be very helpful. One of them is the modulo operator. The modulo operator essentially outputs the remainder of a division problem. So for instance, if I have 11 modulo 5, it would give me the remainder of 11 divided by 5, which in this case would be 1. 
But what if, for instance, I didn't want the remainder, but I wanted like the quotient of the problem or like the answer without the remainder of the problem? Then in this case, you would use two forward slashes and then five. So basically, you're telling the computer to output the quotient of 11 divided by 5, which in this case would be 2. Another format that is kind of unique to Python is exponents. Basically, if I wanted to do 2 to the power of 3, you can write 2 and then 2 multiplication signs and then the number 3, and as you can see it outputs 8. Do note that this double star thing is only unique to Python, so don't get too comfortable with it. But one thing you may be very confused about in Python is like, how does it compute, right? Does it follow the rules of PEMDAS? Does it not? Let me explain this like this. If I have 2 plus 2 times 4, how would the computer compute this, right? Would it do left to right, or would it follow the rules of PEMDAS by doing multiplication first and then adding 2 to that product? How would it work? And basically, in summary, it follows the rules of PEMDAS, because as demonstrated right here, it does multiplication first, which gets 8, and 8 plus 2 is 10, because addition is of less importance than multiplication. So yeah, arithmetic follows the rules of PEMDAS, but one thing that you can do is you can use parentheses in your math. So for instance, if I did want the sum of 2 plus 2 times 4, then I can put 2 plus 2 in parentheses, similar to what you would do in a math class. And this would obviously output 16. Now, one thing that is really good to just get in the habit of is spacing things out. So like you could just do 2 plus 2 minus 3 times 4 and all that, and it'll, it will compute that, but it's really difficult to read for other people, and especially yourself if you're trying to look back on code that you've written before. So it's really good to just have spacing in between things, especially in Python. But that is really it in terms of numeric arithmetic. So basically, in summary, we have addition with the plus sign, subtraction with the dash, multiplication with the star, division with the forward slash, you can find the remainder of a division problem with the modulo sign or the percent sign. You can find the quotient of a division problem using a, two forward slashes. You can find the power of a multiplication problem using two stars. Computers compute math using the rules of PEMDAS. You can also use parentheses in arithmetic, and it's recommended that you start getting in the habit of good spacing and easy to read code. But that is going to be it for today's lesson. I hope you guys enjoyed it. In the next episode, we will finally begin building some very basic programs, and we'll cover some things related to that. If you enjoyed this lesson or want to learn more about other things too, make sure to like this video and to subscribe to Study Buddy, and I will see you in the next lesson.